popularity. My name is Nicola and you're watching Singularity FM, the place where we interview the future. If you guys enjoy this podcast, you can show your support by either writing a review on iTunes or by simply becoming a patron via Patreon or via interviewthefuture.com. Kathy O'Neill is a math PhD from Harvard, a former professor at Barnard College and a former hedge fund quant at Shaw. Kathy is currently a data scientist who wrote a seminal book titled Weapons of Math Distraction, How Big Data Increases Inequality and Threatens Democracy. So welcome to Singularity FM, Kathy. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Excellent. So for those of our viewers and listeners who may not be familiar with you or your work, who is Kathy O'Neill? How would you put or present yourself if you meet somebody at a meeting or at a conference in a couple of sentences? Um, let's see. I guess I'd say I'm a, I was trained to be a mathematician. I'm very nerdy. Um, I like intellectual disagreements that are done in civil ways. I'm interested in systems um, and I'm interested in understanding systems. Right now I'm a writer as well as a data scientist and I have a couple of projects going. I'm a project-based person. So one of my projects is writing a book about the social mechanism of shame. And the other one is to understand with the larger community um, of activists, lawyers, and policymakers, what does it mean for an algorithm to be legal? Mm -hmm. And those are all fantastic and very interesting questions. And of course, the reason why you're a writer is the reason why you're here perhaps most of all uh, on my podcast. But before we get there, I want to give a little bit sort of a uh, taste or, or an insight a little bit in your personal background and how you got to be where you are today. So okay. I want to start up with this question. Why math? You're a geek, but why math? You can be a geek in a million other ways. Well, I have become a geek in a lot of other ways. Um, I think what attracted to me um, to math was the sense that I felt, I remember learning history in eighth grade, learning about the so-called manifest destiny, <laughs> but also learning about like all the deaths and basically the genocide of native Americans and just being like, wait, what? Like what's right and what's, what's moral and what is correct and what's wrong and what's arguable versus what's opinion versus fact. And I was very frustrated by the lack of like conversations that I could have around that, except in my math class um, where it's like, if you got it right, you were right. And nobody disagreed with you. And that's still something I really admire about the community of mathematicians. Like we don't actually, we almost never disagree on the ultimate, like what has actually been proven. There are, there are exceptions to that and they're interesting, but, but it's a pretty amazing, it's an amazing community in that sense. Like we might argue about what's interesting, like what's a mathematically interesting theorem, but we won't agree about what's a theorem. Um, and so that's a very clean concept. It's a very, it appeals to my sense of like wanting to have confirmation and want, I'm a little bit on the spectrum, I think probably, you know, but like not entirely. I have empathy for humans and I really care about people, but I do really have this strong desire for things to have clarity. I see. And so, so that kind of urge for clarity and, and perhaps consensus is, is something that you value. And, and maybe even if I put it, I don't know, security, is that a good word or, or, or kind of stability is maybe a better word because math is stable you know ethics because your your original issue was kind of an ethical issue the extermination or the the genocide against you know the first nations as we call them in yeah. canada or the that's fair north american indians but yeah. instead of going into ethics which could be in some views very subjective you decided to take an objective science like math yeah, that was that's your well solution said. i thought i thought it was objective you know i mean and that's basically been my struggle ever since then, which was basically the, my intellectual awakening. Maybe I was 12 or 13 where I was, I was sort of, I've been in search of something that is objective and then sort of being consistently 
disappointed that things end up being subjective. And I guess at this point, maybe I, I'm no longer, it's no longer my goal to find objectivity. And my goal is to sort of agree on subjectivity in a, in a broader sense. This is a fascinating journey here. I'm so happy I, I started the conversation like this because you, you kind of wanted to avoid ethics, if you will, it seems to me, and be yes. comfortable and safe and stable in the realm of math. Yet you find yourself after a couple of decades ending up in the same place where you started also again in the realm of eth ethics. Don't you find that kind of ironic in a way? I'll just, I, I agree with you and it is ironic, but I'll, I'll just, I'll just say one thing that's better about my life now than it was in eighth grade, which is that I have much more freedom and autonomy to explore these questions in a more thorough way. And to, for that matter, to have impact on those, these questions, you know, like I wasn't, I was powerless in eighth grade and my teacher who claimed manifest destiny was a real thing and was like not something we could argue about that frustrated me a lot because I've always had a kind of combative or at least sort of earnest desire to have intellectual rigorous intellectual debates and like that wasn't allowed in eighth grade you know and now it is so I'm in a different position so I'm much happier now than I was then yeah and quite frankly that teacher did no one favors uh, with that kind of sort of totalitarian view uh, of of the world or, or of history anyway. Uh, it I, I just had a, a kind of a debate with someone on Facebook a couple of days ago about American exceptionalism and I was putting forward the argument it's nothing new and it's nothing unique. You know, the Italians, the Germans, the Jews, the Arabs, the Japanese, the Bulgarians, the Russians, everybody thinks they're exceptional in their own way. And you know, in a way they're right, but in a way they're not because everyone thinks that too. So that's kind yeah. of common. Everyone thinks it's a special. universal exceptionalism. Exactly, exactly. And he was trying to say no, but the American exceptionalism is really the one through exceptionalism, which is yeah. kind of, sounds to me like I'm not buying it. Catholicism or, or any of the other religion who, that says my God is the only one through God. And by the way, it reminded me very much to Bob Dylan's song with God on our side. Hmm. You know, I, I don't know if you you've heard that. Oh, I'll send you a link. It's phenomenal. It's basically going through the story and it was written in the 1960s, how basically we came to North America and we killed the North American Indians with God on our side. Then we did uh, this war and that war. And then we had the wor first world war, the second world war, God on our side, and then the Russians in the Cold War. And God is always on our side. And, you know, and we may end up end up in a nuclear war because that song was written like in the 1960s. But we shouldn't be worried because, you see, God is always on our side. So we have say, nothing to worry about. That sounds almost like Kurt Vonnegut. It's brilliant. Like, one yeah. of, personally speaking, one of my, I mean, Bob Dylan has a number of amazing songs, mm -hmm. uh, poetically speaking. But that one's definitely one of my favorite. All right. So let's move on here. So are you a statistician, a mathematician now or a data scientist? I'm a data scientist. Um, I never really was trained in statistics, so I could not possibly claim that mantle. Um, I'm also a mathematician, but I'm active in my data science work. Mm -hmm. Very cool. Okay. And so, so you start up with, with this kind of ethical impetus, if you will, you go into math, yeah. you become a P you, you get a PhD from Harvard, then you become a professor then how and why do you make the move from there into becoming a, a hedge fund quant? Mm, gosh. Because that's a big jump. Like, and, and, and it's kind of very different from the security and stability of academia, if you will. Because in academia, I don't know if you were tenured or not, but once especially, one, the, the whole point of most people is to get tenured and then basically you cruise. Right. Uh, you chose to yeah, step in some away. Sense, in some sense, you're answering my question. Um, I don't like cruising. Um, ah. And it was 2006, so it was actually not that hard to get a job. Um, I mean, I was good at math. and um, But all I really needed to do was be good at math. Like the interviews were like math puzzle after math puzzle after math puzzle. And at some point, I actually said to one of my interviewers, like, I can do math puzzles. Like... If that's what you're asking, then just give me the job. And they yeah. did. 
Um, I think nowadays it would be much harder to get a job than it was then. 2006, again, um, they were hiring up a lot of people. Also, um, you know, I had kind of forgotten that lesson I had learned in eighth grade, to be honest. Like, I don't want to act as if I was sort of an ethicist at all. I wasn't. I had I had essentially become an artist, which is what I think mathematics really is. It's like an art form. I agree. And um, I thought it was beautiful. I still think it's beautiful. But I, I was sort of like, I want more feedback. I want, you know, more interaction. I want more impact on the world. And I thought it'd be cool to be in like a business, like a hedge fund in New York city. And, and it was cool, but it was, but what I realized after a couple of years, it's like, Oh wait, I don't just want impact. I want positive impact. And like, <laughs> I didn't think that's what actually I was doing. Um, that's but, a crucial you know, distinction that most is. people should get, I hope. Right. And the point is that I had gotten myself to the point where I, I didn't even consider the possibility that I would be making the world worse um, because I was very naive. But after being, you know, living through the financial crisis, it's pretty obvious that you have to think about that kind of thing. So I left, they left Shaw, I left, and then I went to risk. And then I got even more disillusioned in that sector and left finance altogether and joined data science because like I needed a job. And that that's when I was like, wait a second, I'm not actually making the world a better place here either. In fact, and like, by then I was like, I'd learned my lesson about assuming things must be good if you don't see evidence to the contrary. And I started looking around with the help of my blog readers for what I could, what I call creepy algorithms. And I found a whole bunch of them. And so like, that's really what happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and we'll, we'll speak about that in a second. But the last couple of questions before we get there is, don't you find it sad, though? I find it personally kind of sad that brilliant people like you, because I know, honestly, a ton of super brilliant people with super advanced degrees in math or in physics and stuff who end up working in one of two places, either uh, in hedge funds and other financial institutions, that's to say kind of Wall Street, or in Google, Facebook, and the likes. And in one case, the smartest people work on making us click ads. And in the other case, the smartest people work on sort of like imaginary, in, in many cases, sort of derivatives and whatnot, that in many cases can do more damage than good. So yeah, it's really sad. I was on a panel at a math conference over the weekend at Boston College, and you're, it's a, it was a jobs panel. So in some sense, like I think I was supposed to be advertising leaving mathematics and being working in an industry job, and I ended up not really sure <laughs> I was encouraging anyone. Um, I was very brutally honest about what's good and what's bad about the experience, and but also brutally honest about the sense that you have often, as you point out, that what you're doing isn't actually making the world a better place at all and possibly is actively harming it. I mean, I think of the, working as a, at a hedge fund as sort of like being a, a junkyard dog, like scavenging for scraps in the financial system, which is like got a lot to scavenge off of. It, it's you Maybe you can think of it as benign sometimes, but other times it's definitely not. Yeah, and I, I even uh, have friends who did that. And, and I was actually reading about the guy, and I forget where I was reading about, who uh, made the same choice like you and uh, for noble reasons because he's donating, I forget, 75 or 80 percent of all of his income to all those charities. And I was thinking that's phenomenal, but I'm still not convinced that in the end of the day you're not doing more damage than good because, like, if you're doing damage with the left hand and then you're doing good with the right hand, but you're taking a fraction of the left hand to give to the right hand to do good, then the difference is exponential almost. And one is incremental improvement and the other may be exponential damage. So I'm not yeah. sure that the net effect is positive. <laughs> I mean, I'll go further. Like you're, because I think about systems rather than individuals, I'm not going to like, hate any individual who like once they get rich in some kind of messed up system then decides to give to charities but like what you're doing is perpetuating that system possibly making it even more extreme and then 
I'll also add, like, you get to decide what you mean by good, right? So it becomes a, um, a, a, a the, the charity system becomes sort of a reflection of what rich, possibly mathematically inclined um, individuals think is a good idea, which isn't necessarily, I mean, it's not at all democratic, for example, but it's not necessarily even sort of a, any kind of universal concept of what is actually good. So it, it, it becomes less and less democratic and more and more sort of capital, capitalistic defined. Okay, but let's, let's start going here into the meat of the matter then, because people would reply, look, this is math. How is, and math is, quote, black and white. Another quote is, you can't argue with math. So now, Kathy, you're telling us that sort of, especially with your book in the beginning, that math is, or at least was, fueling the problems of the 2008 crisis. How is that the case? Well, okay, so two things. First of all, I want to distinguish between math itself and people's trust in math, because I actually think people's trust and possibly their admiration of mathematical talent and mathematics is really a bigger problem than the math itself in certain sense, um, because people just blindly trust mathematics. Like as soon as you say, oh, it's math, you won't understand it. People are like, oh, you're right. I'm not a, I don't have a PhD. I have no right to speak. Even when it's about their own job, you know, even if it's like the, their own retirement fund if the, in the financial crisis situation. Um, I'm not just, I'm not, but by the way, I'm not at all blaming the people that lost their retirement for the system. My point is that mathematics, authority of mathematics is used as a, is weaponized and people use it as a shield for whatever happened. Like, oh, that was math. Or this is math, you can't question it. The second thing is, it's actually not math. It's data science, which, well, we can get into a question of whether that's even deserves the name science. I think it doesn't, but it's in, in some sense, it's empirical data. It's not math. So math is like, you have axioms, you make logical deductions, you prove things. There's nothing proven in finance, nothing. <laughs> um, it is, you have evidence for things. Like, you know, what I would do at a- you Make at money a, or you lose money, it's pretty clear. Well, that is the ultimate uh, pr evidence, right? But, but my point is that even in order to like deploy an algorithmic trading model, you don't prove anything using mathematics, you provide evidence using statistical analysis. Um, so it's just not math. It's like, it's an empirical science at best. Um, so people just throw around terms because they work. And that goes back to the first point, which is that as a marketing ploy saying, we're, we, we have the most sophisticated mathematicians working for us and they're doing this unbelievably cool math that just shuts everybody up. The truth is we had like weak statistical evidence that this was working for the last few years and if it was working for the last few years, why don't we just make the bet that it'll continue to work, even if it's destabilizing the overall system? That's what actually was going on. Mm -hmm. And and I think that's why I watched an interview with you where you argued that math isn't so different from religion in that sense. Absolutely. Yeah, it right? is. Tell us a little more about that, because a large number of, of my audience would be engineers, IT professionals, math geeks of all kinds of sorts. And they would surely take an exception with me if I were to make that statement. So, so and I, I support it, but I don't have your credibility. So please unpack <laughs> this for us. Yeah, I mean, look, I love math, just to be clear. And, you know, just going to that, that algebraic geometry conference this weekend was nostalgic for me. I mean, somebody in the audience was telling me that they were using my work from a long time ago. That made me really teary eyed. And it, it is beautiful. And it's a beautiful construction. And, and we talk about sort of crystalline concepts that are pure, purely beautiful. Um, that's not what I'm point, pointing out. When I say that math is like a religion, what I really mean is the way that math is wielded as an authority um, to the rest of the world. Um, it is both uh, intimidating and it is in sort of trust inspiring. So that combination of trust and fear is the way that I think often people think about gods. And the Either inability both, to question, I think, is crucial here. Not, not being allowed to question it. Not being allowed to. So you're saying you, you have no right to ask questions. You have to trust this. Um, now, 
And that goes to the point I was trying to make, I was I alluded to before about whether data science deserves the, the, the name science. The whole point of a true science is, it is all about questions. It's all about saying, no, like give me evidence that this is true. Give me evidence that that's true. And data science is being sort of given the authority of a science without any of the tests that we should be putting it to. So, you know, uh, so there's some like, you know, there's so much IP law. There's so many laws that are protecting the source codes of these algorithms that are being used, for example, to fire teachers. But there's no way for a, a person interested in um, civic fairness to say, show me how these teachers are being assessed at their job, sometimes being fired, often being denied tenure or denied raises based on some scoring system that you know is hidden. Um, and, and if you ask questions about that, that's where you're going to get that authority being uh, sent back to you, saying like, you know, this is this is math. You should just trust it. By the way, I should add, like, you know, I'm credentialed in math, as you point out, and that's why that kind of shaming mechanism, if you will, math shaming, doesn't work on me. If someone tells me it's math, you won't understand it. I say, what? You know, what are, wait a second, like that is a weird defense of an indefensible uh, political situation. Um, it, the truth is, if it's math, I should understand it. And if you're not willing to explain it to me, um, then it's your problem, not mine. You know, that, but, but I can say that because I have a PhD in math. My kind of like the goal, the goal of my book really is to say, actually, everyone should be able to say that you shouldn't need a math PhD to, to know what your rights are. I interviewed Frank J. Tipler on my podcast some time ago, and uh, he told me that the singularity is inevitable. And I was skeptical because he understood quantum mechanics and I didn't. Yeah, well, he was so. full of shit. I, I, I'm sorry, <laughs> but that is that is exactly the kind of shit that I hate. And I, I just started swearing because it got under my skin. It gets under my skin when people do that. Yeah, but that's like the most shouting example that I can recall. And of course, he's right, because my understanding of quantum mechanics is tiny, minuscule, ridiculous compared to his, of course. So he and was I... shaming you in real time. He was saying, you're not allowed to ask questions. I mean, and I'm so glad that you do continue to ask questions and we all must because well, it's, the singularity is not a mathematical concept. I mean, at least the way I understand he was probably framing it. It's a question of human rights and free will. We all need to think about that. So it's not good enough for some physicist to be like, or whatever he, is, he calls himself, to say, oh, trust it to the experts. That is not appropriate. Yeah, and, and my, my blogging name is Socrates anyway, so I'm the name with the guy with the questions. So I wouldn't yes. be a Socrates unless I have questions, right? It's important to have questions. <laughs> so let's talk about your book, though, Weapons of Math Destruction. First of all, I love the title. It's like Thank you. fantastic, it's impactful, it's memorable, and it goes straight to the point. So tell us, what's the thesis? What, what I realized um, after I started researching these um, algorithms as a data scientist myself was that they were very consistently doing a couple of things, even without any kind of collaboration between companies. So let's just think about advertising. It's an enormous industry and there's lots of competition. But one thing that every single data scientist working in advertising does consistently is we differentiate between high value and low value customers. And we give high value customers opportunities that we deny low value customers. And the, the way we define these high value versus low value customers is off, also pretty well coordinated, even if it's not, it's not like consciously coordinated. It's just really easy to find who has money. It's really easy to figure out race, gender, um, location, um, and in fact, location is sometimes a proxy for race and, and, and wealth, of course. And so just that alone, just that one fact I just told you, and this, I said it in advertising, but of course, it's also quite true in other fields like credit or insurance or getting a job or keeping a job or getting into college. And for that matter, it's those kinds of proxies are also used in the predictive policing algorithms and in the crime risk score algorithms. Like they're used... Basically, and I just said, wow, demographic profiling, which is super easy to do with the data that we now collect, is the basis of funneling 
opportunities to people who are lucky and away from people who are unlucky. So ultimately my book, the thesis of my book is big data techniques makes lucky people luckier and unlucky people unluckier. And as a result, direct result, you're going to be increasing inequality, number one, and you're going to be threatening democracy. And so this is my subtitle, um, how big data mm-hmm. increases inequality and threatens democracy. Yes. yes. Absolutely. And then each chapter basically is like, I go through an industry and to sort of lay out exactly how it works and why I think it's making things worse rather than better. Yeah. And you go through a diversity of industry from like credit rating, rating to insurance to college applications through the political or participatory process in our democracies uh, and all of those. Uh, we, so I, I highly recommend people should uh, read your book. I, I personally listened to it twice. It's about six hours or so, so it's not it's not so long, and it's pretty sort of illuminating. Uh, but let me ask you this: um, the traditional answer would be, "Look, Kathy, we are not racist because we don't put race anywhere on our questionnaires, or no one is taking race into account anywhere. So it's not like we're targeting black people to give them higher mortgages or higher insurance or higher interest rates or anything like that. How could you claim that we are being unfair or towards, you know, different races or uh, ethnic groups or what have you? Well, that's the easy, you give me a softball question there because, um, Everybody knows, um, I think by now, that there's a lot of proxies for race in this in this world and that that's the data we collect. You're right that we almost never collect race data directly, but we use the proxies to race like zip code. I mean, and zip code is only a proxy to race because we have a segregated society. Um, and like, if you just look at the census, you see that it is a proxy for race. It's more so in some places than others, um, but it definitely is. And so since we use geolocation without thinking, it's completely clear that we have access to racial data, even if we don't have a proof of race um, in a given situation. So just to be clear, uh, you know, I don't go around saying like, oh, somebody made, made their credit algorithm racist. Like that's not, it's certainly not um, what people set out to do. It's what people end up doing. Um, but I would argue like to be, completely honest, the thing that bothers me in some sense more than the racism is just the assumption that it is appropriate to deny or give people opportunities based on their um, demographics at all, right? Just based on their class. By the way, and to be clear, like I, I've learned a lot about the law um, since I started investigating this stuff. There is no protection against classism in the law you know it's actually totally legal to deny poor people things um well that that there's like no protection against that you know you could just be like sorry i'm not going to hire you because you're poor that's not against the law there are protected classes and race gender um sort of disability status all sorts of things veterinary veteran status those are those are protected classes but class itself is not a protected class and to be um, to be clear, like most of the other kinds of things like racism, like sexism, et cetera, which are problems, of course, are problems because what we're really doing is we're making classist algorithms and they have disparate impact on those other protected classes, but they are nominally classist. And that's already a problem for me because inequality is a problem for not just for, I mean, it's a problem for our country. Yeah. And I would say that, you know, different sort of uh, it it kind of perhaps stems from a sort of an original ethical choice if you will because let's say I, i'm here in canada and say for example um you know uh, our much vaunted healthcare system uh presumes that you may be a millionaire and i may be homeless but if we walk tomorrow into an er room we're going to sit next to each other and we're going to wait and if i walked in front of you i'll be served first and a doctor would look at me first. Whereas in the United States, so uh, in Canada, the presumption is everybody with respect to healthcare must get equal treatment. And you know, there's all kinds of problems with the system and so on. But in the United States, the presumption is, of course, if you're a rich person, you're going to get to a private clinic, you're going to get better service period. And if you're like someone who is on social security, well, tough luck kind of deal. 
right? So that's the starting presumption, which then ends up sort of representing itself into throughout the system. And, and of course, you have the Scandinavian model and and so on. But but let me tell you, okay, so those are problems of, of sort of algorithms, and we'll go into the details a little bit more, but let me still talk a little bit more about your title here. Why take it as far as calling them weapons of mass destruction? Because, of course, that's like wordplay of weapons of mass destruction. Is it so bad, really? I mean, I actually think it is, um, potentially. I'm not saying it's the biggest problem we face as a country. We have but people would say, come on, Kathy, we're not killing millions of people like weapons of mass destruction do. We are degrading we are degrading lives, and I would argue millions of lives. And um, they're not, to be clear, like dead people by the side of the road like you'd see in a car crash. Um, you know, I, I sometimes think about sort of the car industry. Yes, like it was must must have been very exciting to invent cars, but then pretty soon people saw that they were very deadly. And, you know, ultimately we got Ralph Nader got us seatbelts and uh, we got crash test dummies and, you know, they were sexist for a while. You know, it, like it's an evolution of like, Hey, wait a second. We, like, let's, let's consider the cost as well as the benefit. What, right, right now where we are is like, we're very, very excited about our new technology, which is called, big data algorithms or AI. Now, now they people call it AI because that sounds sexier. I'm sure it'll be called something else in a few years. Uh, and um, we do not even see the dead people by the side of the road. The problem is that the, the failures of AI are almost invisible. Now, let me give you an example. Most people have to take a personality tests in this country, uh, in the US, in order to get a job because jobs, first of all, job applications are online, finding even Matt, finding out what jobs you could apply for happens online. That system is really messed up because it just matches people like you used uh, have historically gotten jobs like this. So you can already assume that that's based on very biased historical data. Then once you even find out the jobs that people like you might get, you apply. And then there's a, there's at least one or two filters that are, basically maybe stupid AI, but AI sort of algorithms that can keep you from ever getting interviewed. How will you ever know or prove that those things unfairly kept you from a job that you deserved? Especially that first part where you're like matchmaking, you go to a website that tells you, look at all these jobs that you could apply for. How about the jobs that you should have seen, but you didn't see because the algorithm decided that your score wasn't high enough in that category. And how did they build that score? You'll never know. My point is that there is a lot of invisibility, invisible failure in this system. Um, and it's not killing you. It's not, it's not making you bleed, but it's denying a lot of people opportunities that we expect and deserve to have. Yeah, and in terms of, seeing dead people on the on the side of the road i was thinking we're going to discuss that a little bit later but actually there are dead people besides the uh, the road uh, about 10,000 of them at least in myanmar and about a million refugees uh and and it's been probably the the largest ethnic cleansing slash genocide of the 20th first century at least so far uh which was largely facilitated coordinated and in some uh in some cases sort of uh, um, take an exponential, if you will, by, by, by Facebook and in general, and especially, believe it or not, Facebook Messenger played a crucial role yeah. of coordinating some of the attacks uh, on the Rohingya Muslim minority in Burma. Yeah, I mean, and I, I spend a lot of time in the sort of penultimate chapter or the politics chapter talking about what the concerns I have around Facebook's newsfeed algorithm, which optimizes to keeping you on Facebook, which is to say like keeping you upset, angry, riled up, outraged, and misinformed. Um, to, and, and that's a direct sort of consequence um, is that you get crazy stuff happening. And then of course they claim mathematical neutrality. And that, that goes straight to the, um, the, the sort of philosophical 
conflict that I've lived through my entire life, which is like, what, it, what does it mean to claim neutrality? What does it mean to claim objectivity? I think it's well past the point where we should listen to Facebook or There's any of those guys. There's a very famous internal letter or email, I should say, uh, by one of the uh, closest people to Mark Zuckerberg. I forget his name, but he's one of the VPs at Facebook, where he basically sent an email saying that Facebook is inherently always and ever good by its very nature. And therefore, its promotion everywhere all the time for all people is by default the right thing to do without exceptions. <laughs> Can you imagine either on the one hand believing that or on the other hand saying that and not believing it? Like either way, that guy is, I mean, deeply, deeply troubled. <laughs> <laughs> deeply troubled but that that's that's a laughing matter for me but but it's actually life and death for people absolutely uh, you know and i i have to say it's like that guy sounds like a sociopath i don't know who it is but you know he's along the lines of the jamie diamond uh model of humanity um but there's lots of people in in facebook and google who i've spoken with who are not sociopaths and who bring up these questions of some subjectivity and consequences. And I've been told by fancy people working at those companies that, you know, the conversations really about fairness and, and, and ethics is really, really good until a corporate lawyer shows up and reminds everybody that the only actual constraint that they face is the shareholder value constraint. So I guess for me, it's even sadder that you don't need to be a sociopath to end up behaving the way that email read, which yeah, is yeah. we're going to push this business model no matter what. And on a separate yeah. occasion, by the way, so Mark Zuckerberg actually disagreed with his friend on that one, but supported him. Uh, but on a separate occasion, uh, Mark actually sent out an email saying about a certain technology that was competitive in some of its aspects with respect to Facebook. And he said something to the effect that this may be good for the world, but it's actually not good for Facebook. Therefore, we cannot support it. <laughs> wow. So, so that was his that was his caveat. Yes, yes. So so he admitted it's a good thing, but it's not good for them and therefore they can't support it and they should actually actively oppose it. So, well, basically that's that's a way of asking who fits... Okay, so let me backtrack first. How do we define a weapon of mass, a, a weapon of math destruction? Well, I'm glad you asked because I'm a mathematician. I, I, may, I try to make definitions um, very front and center. So I characterize weapons of math destruction with three properties. The first is that it's important, widespread used uh, for important decisions, typically around somebody's like people, right? So you're making a decision about a person, whether they're worthy of something, some kind of financial opportunity, some kind of job or livelihood issue, um, or some kind of uh, liberty something of something about their their actual liberty like the policing or the justice system related or there's a, some kind of information like political information uh or 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 news type thing so it's important it's being used widely to make important decisions about people that's the first thing the second thing is it's secret people don't understand why or why not they're being denied opportunities or offered opportunities and the third thing is that it it's unfair and that, and that I could sort of define it being like unfair to individuals. Like it, it makes mistakes. That is, it's almost a unnecessary condition because all algorithms make mistakes. Like, I don't know a data scientist who would say I have a perfect algorithm. There's no such thing, but the kind of mistakes it makes is the point is that it's important. So it, it makes important mistakes. So it denies people opportunities, like important opportunities, like jobs. And then as a consequence, this is like an observation. It's almost like a theorem, if you will. Like if you have those three properties, important, secret, and destructive, making mistakes, 
then it's not just destructive for the individual, but it actually creates a negative feedback loop, a destructive feedback loop where it actually undermines its original goal if that goal was supposed to be positive. So there's just lots of examples where we're like, oh, we're gonna make teachers better. And in fact, you actually make teachers worse. Or you're gonna make education better. You're making education worse. You're gonna make um, jobs more fairly distributed. You actually make jobs less fairly distributed. Like the, or, or, or the mistakes that these algorithms make are scaled to such an extent that like entire subpopulations are incapable of getting a job or you're going to get insurance to be fairer but you actually end up making insurance less fair and scaled again scale becomes a big thing in because algorithms once they're built can be you know can be raised to an enormous scale as we saw with facebook um so that's those are those are the characteristics of weapons of math destruction and uh, people have come up since i wrote the book i've have sort of shown me a bunch of different examples. They're like, oh, I think I have a WMD. I want to tell you about it. And they're often right. Now, to be clear, I really insist on that first property, that it's important. Um, because the whole point is like, if it's destructive, if it's, if it's unfair to people, that should really matter to them, right? I mean, they might not know it happened. I already told you about the invisibility of the failures. They might not know they were unfairly denied, an opportunity or something, but it has to matter to them because the whole point I'm, I, I want to get to is sort of how do we fight back? And the, the answer has to be like, well, what are the stakes? The stakes are high. That's how we, def we constructed it. We constructed it so that the stakes are high. Often, by the way, there are laws. There are like, these are regulated industries. These are not the first time people have like unfairly offered jobs or credit or insurance or what have you. There are laws. We're just not enforcing laws because, as, because guess what? People trust math too much. So, and, and they're in, intimidated by algorithms. So we, we have these laws, they're not being enforced. So I, that's what the conversation I want to get to is like, how do we enforce laws? Like let's, how do we enforce laws in the, in the age of AI? Well, let's talk about the uh, law enforcement example here that you give in your book and that's Pred Paul, uh, predictive policing. Uh, sort of software uh, program based on statistical algorithms or methods, which kind of is very minority report-esque yes. in, in its nature. And, and of course, the, the defenders would say, look, uh, we have scarce resources and we have to deploy them in the most optimal manner possible. And, uh, you know, those statistical algorithms tell us where the crime will be or likely to be and they're actually right because when we go there look we arrested so many people we, we stopped so many burglaries we we caught so many people with like you know uh marijuana or or small drug possession or or you know grand theft auto or what have you what do you answer to that because they say look it works yeah that's it's an important question and i'm so glad you asked it because i really do think it is one of the worst algorithms and I'm so glad to be able to speak out against it. My, um, it's a very nerdy answer, but it's also extremely important for this, for this topic, which is that we don't actually have crime data. My audience just, are mostly geeks or nerds and, and stuff. Oh, so good. So they'll get it. Yeah. What, what and, and you said it just what just now, like the, the sort of the proof of it so-called working, to put in scare quotes, is that, look, we find people to arrest. And that, that is the definition of success. So this is a, a thing I go into at, in, at length at, in the book, is like, it's all about your definition of success, right? And for, for PredPol and for other predictive policing algorithms, success is arrest, which is to say what we're really targeting is this arrest data. So then you have to ask, your question, ask the question, the critical question is, are arrest are arrests a good proxy for crime? And the answer is absolutely not. Yeah, absolutely not. And you you mentioned smoking pot. The only question you really need to ask yourself is, have you ever met anyone who smoked pot but then didn't get arrested immediately afterwards? Has that ever happened in your experience? <laughs> and when you ask that question, everyone laughs because of, I mean, it's laugh, it's laughable. The idea that there's like, 
a, a, an arrest for every crime, if you just think about it, even for a moment, you realize it's ridiculous. And by the way, I'll add sm pot smoking. And okay, I'm, let me just finish the pot smoking example. Whites and blacks smoke pot at the same rate. Black people get arrested five times more often than whites. So the real point isn't that we don't arrest people, is that we do sometimes arrest people, but the missingness of the, the data, if you will, is unequally distributed. So we arrest black people for it, but not white people. In fact, we don't really arrest that many people for smoking pot, but when we do, we arrest black people. So conclusion is that if we are like looking for where is the crime gonna be based on where were the arrests in the past, we're just gonna go keep doing what we've been doing, which is arresting black people for smoking pot. Now, I don't claim that there are no actual violent crimes, okay? so. But let's look at that data. Murders. This is a, an extreme case in the other direction where you know there was a crime because there's a dead body. <laughs> like you actually have proof of a crime. Murders only lead to an arrest about 56% of the time. And if the victim was black, less than 50% of the time. So it's, it's about 50-50 whether there's actually an arrest. So even there, when you know there was a crime, arrests happen half the time. Think about another violent crime category, rape. Rapes are famously underreported. We don't even know it by how much, but like, let's assume 10% of rapes are reported, which I think is probably generous. And by the way, it's also a political wins thing. I mean, in Houston, after Trump got elected, the number of reported rapes went down by 40% in a couple of months. That's not because nobody was raped. It's because people were afraid to report rapes, especially oh. in the Latino community. So rapes. 10% are reported. And then I listened to this reveal episode a few months ago. Of the reported rapes, 6% lead to an arrest. So I just do the math. Arrests are bad proxies for crimes. And I don't even know what the racial disparity is on who gets arrested for rapes, but I assume there is one. I guess my point, my overall point is, this is not good enough data to do, to do math with, to, do to call it data science because it's just not a good enough proxy for crime. Now, having said that, you could ask the question, and it's an Orwellian sort of thought experiment, like what would we need, what kind of surveillance apparatus would we need to have better crime statistics? We'd need, let's face it, a, a camera in every room, in every bathroom, in every hallway, in every elevator, in every, on every street, we're getting with there. AI that can recognize crime when it sees it. Like imagine that world. And <laughs> let's all agree that we don't want to live in that world, but that would be the world we would need for us to think that like crime data would actually be recorded, right? We don't have recorded crime data, but that's what we would need. So we were like, ooh, we don't want to live in that world. But guess what? We are increasingly living in that world. And especially if you live in a project in like an inner city, there are basically cameras everywhere. And to the, my final point will be like, guess where the police are going? Guess where the police are being sent by PredPol and other places and other kinds of pre predictive policing? Exactly to those places that are already overly surveilled and overly criminalized. And where, by the way, we criminalize people for things like mental health problems and addiction. So, I mean, that's really, and okay, you know, I will say one more thing. And I've talked to the people that work at these companies and it's very frustrating. I asked them, you know, don't you agree that nonviolent crimes like being poor, peeing on the sidewalk, like subway jumping, or having a mental health mis problem that you that is not being treated, or being addicted, those things are the bread and butter of predictive policing because guess what? It's very predictable that addicts will become stay addicts, that mentally health, you know, sick people will still be mentally sick that people will poor, poor will be poor. So that's, that's, that's the data that's the most predictable. And I'm like, well, why don't you, why don't you, if you're being honest, why don't you just try to predict like violent crimes and robberies, just assaults and car thefts. And the answer is, oh, the data isn't predictable enough for that day, for that stuff. So we couldn't get a, a, a like a good model that has good um, sort of accuracy if we only used things that aren't criminalizing poverty. Do you see what I'm saying? Like I might've said this in the wrong order, but my point is that like, I think an 
like a better, more useful model would be like, get rid of all the things that are just punishing poor people for various poverty issues and just try to predict violent assault and robberies and murders. And they're like, oh, the data's not good enough for that. And I'm like, right, exactly. But even if it's not like violent crime per se, why is there no predictive uh, modeling of, let's say, the next Bernie Madoff or the next subprime mortgage scam or, you know, all the financial crimes like the next Enron and WorldCom and, right. you know, all those companies that did all those ridiculous things that screwed people out of billions upon billions of billions of dollars. Well, actually, I do think. I mean, there is... if you look at it mathematically, and I'm not mathematically inclined, you would say maybe. I mean, it's a point of view, of course. But uh, Wall Street must be pretty clustered for high and high value financial crime, wouldn't it? That makes sense to me. Okay. So number one, the real answer is the people who are good at models don't work for the regulators. They work for the people doing the cr crimes, <laughs> the banks and the hedge funds. <laughs> That's the real answer. They get hired to be quanted hedge funds and, yeah. and, and, and so on, right? And the crime committers are, are, are typically much better paid um, than the, you know, the uh, cops. The second answer is there are some models that are being built in these various regulators to try to detect Enron type accounting fraud. So it's not impossible and it is being done. But the third answer, and I think it's the most philosophically important one, is that actually the crises are different from each other. Um, and that's sort of like fundamentally the problem with the kind of risk management that exists, you know, like I worked at risk metrics, we did the value at risk model. We did all these things that were like replay, like black Friday, replay the financial crisis, replay, blah, blah, blah. Make sure that this portfolio of this bank or holding company or hedge fund would not suffer unduly. If this particular event happened again today, Well, guess what? That's not what's going to happen because we're all girding ourselves for yet another exact replay of these things. That's not what's going to happen next. So what we're doing is it's like squeezing the balloon, right? We're saying we're going to prevent the 10 most famous bad things from happening again. So I guess we're going to have to invent an 11th thing. And to be clear, there is no algorithm to to prevent something that's never happened before. I mean that's the that's the philosophically interesting thing is that algorithms and data can only you know propagate. They can't invent. And that's by the way why the singularity isn't going to happen, just FYI. <laughs> the singularity is not going to happen. Like algorithms aren't self-conscious. They do not they will not gain self-consciousness and they will not do unexpected things. There's just it's not it's not happening. We have real problems that we we're trying to ignore. That's why we keep talking about the singularity. By the way, I should say, considering your the subtitle "Interview the Future," that I have declared myself a futurist, um, simply for the reason that I think people who have declared themselves futurists are a distraction, and they're trying to like steer the conversation away from like the problems we actually need to deal with now into problems that we'll never ever have to deal with. And as a futurist, I'd like to say, let's, let's deal with the problems we have now so that in the future, we won't have these problems. I'd just like to reframe the, the, the conversation around futurism. That's very interesting. So, uh, okay, let, let's grab that thought and we'll come back to your, to your book because that's kind of a, a traditional topic for my audience and they'll be very curious to, to, to talk about this. So let's, let's shift a little bit about AI here and how does it fit in this big picture, right? Because... Uh, algorithms taken to a certain level, whether with deep learning or, you know, reinforced learning is kind of the, the fad lately and all that stuff. You know, the idea is eventually we're going to get to artificial intelligence. And one of my previous interviews, Joshua Bach actually, um, would take a, a similar position like you. 
because he said that basically AI is statistics on steroids. Uh, and and so, so, so you're saying that we'll never get to the point where algorithms give birth to AI or, or, or even more. We wouldn't have AI to human level. It's just, it's like even the questions bother me because like, and it's not a complaint about your question because I know this is, this is the way we talk about it. The way I look at it is we, if you're asking whether human or whether ethics are embedded in AI, and I define AI now just by the way it's being, by used, the way it's being used as just an, a synonym to algorithm. The answer is absolutely. Ethics are embedded in AI. And I've already said what, how they are. The most important one being, let's take advantage of poor people. Let's give, let's, let's like offer things to rich people. I mean, it's, it, it just take that as a kind of a simplistic, overly simplistic way of thinking about it. Or if you want to think about health, healthcare insurance, health insurance algorithms, like let's keep the healthy people and get rid of the sick people. Like that's what algorithms do. Yeah, actually, a better way of putting it is to quote yourself. You say, quote, and that's what, one of my two favorite quotes from your book is, algorithms are opinions embedded in code. In code end of Thank quote. you. They're opinions that's embedded perfect. in code. Yeah. And for that reason, they're also values embedded in code. And exactly. they're deployed in specific ways because of the values that the deployers, the owners, the owners of capital, the one, that's how they think. That's how they make money. There's a lot of ethics already happening in our AI is what I'm saying. And in order to pretend that it's not up to us to decide how to build this and how to use it, we have people who are using it saying, oh, maybe the algorithms have their own ethics. You see what I'm saying? That is ludicrous. It is just a rule that we have imposed. It's a complicated rule, but at the end of the day, it's just a rule that we've imposed and then we've told people trusted its math. And by the way, if there's if you have any ethical complaints, you can talk to the algorithm. It doesn't make any sense. It's just a dodge. It's a dodge for our personal responsibilities as a society, as individual owners. I, I, I hear what you're saying, but the claim is like coming from, let's say, people like Ray Kurzweil, most famously, perhaps, is that, you know, eventually uh, we would get to the point where first algorithms, and he says 2029 or so, uh, would reach human level of intelligence. Uh, and then, of course, by 2045, he talks about the singularity where a single uh, sort of AI would be able to have the the intellectual uh, intelligence capacity of all of humanity and so on. Can so, I just so, can I just respond to that? Because it, 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 it's like the guy doesn't even know what intelligence is. <laughs> I mean, really, I mean, I feel sorry for the guy. Like I listened to his interview with Neil deGrasse Tyson on a Star Talk podcast. And I'm embarrassed for Neil deGrasse Tyson because he didn't push back at all. When Neil, Neil seemed to be sold on it. Oh my God, it was embarrassing. I mean, they call themselves scientists. But here's what Kurzweil said. He said, you know how it takes a long time to read War and Peace? Well, I'm going to upload War and Peace to my brain and then I'm going to, and then I'll, I'll be done in two seconds. Okay, so just let's think about that. I mean, Presumably he means, well, let's, let's guess, let's ask what he means. Like, ideally he doesn't mean he just wants the text in readable format in his brain, because that's what we already have with Google. We already could ask Google to show me the text of War and Peace. And it's not inside our brain, but it's close enough. So maybe that's what he means. If that's what he means, then that's not intelligence. I think you he can all agree on that. more about Watson, what Watson did with Jeopardy and how Watson... Yeah, so right. he means retrieval of information, but information is an understanding, right? So the way I think about it is like when I was 15 and going through my ethical crises, my first, first of many ethical crises, I read the brothers Karamazov, right? And I read it and I loved it. And it was like, for me, a book about Alyosha. And then I read it when I was 25 and it was a book about Dimitri. No, Ivan. Yvonne was, it was a book about Yvonne. Then I read it when I was 35 and it was about Dimitri and I'm going to read it again in a few years and it's going to be about the father. I'm pretty sure. And then like when I'm elderly, I'll read it and it'll be about the father's Osima, right? My point is that 
it was a different book every time I read it because it affected me differently because I interacted with it differently in a kind of intellectual, emotional, psychological way, right? Literally different understanding of it. And so my question is to Ray Kurzweil, like which book is the book? Whose understanding of the book would we upload if, if indeed you're saying we should upload an understanding? How could that even make sense? Because it's, it's an interaction. I'm, my point is that intelligence is not information retrieval. Intelligence is a much broader, much more interesting thing than playing Jeopardy with Watson. Yeah, we, we, we spoke a lot more about that uh, in my last interview with Gary Marcus, uh, who talks a lot about that. Um, okay, so, so you're a singularity skeptic, it's fair to say. Very much, but I am a futurist. <laughs> okay, we'll come back on that in a second then. But so, so you think that machines would never be able to equal humans in intelligence in, under your definition? I, under, but yeah, I mean, to be clear, machines are much better than us at calculations. Sure, sure. No one. So I'm not that. saying that they, I'm not sort of, you tell me a skill, I'll tell you whether machines can do it. You know what I mean? Like Basically, the idea is anything that human can do intellectually, machines would be better at. That's the, the idea of the singularity. That's the Turing test, is that if you have a closed door and you're, you know, communicating with a computer and a human in 2028, 20, 29, according to Ray Kurzweil, computers will pass the, the Turing test, which means they will be for all effective purposes indistinguishable from humans in all of their capacities to reason, argue, yeah. perceive, and intellectually, and so on. And, and this is a continuing conversation, obviously, like Gary's thoughts, I've read his book, uh, his recent book, are interesting and understanding common sense. And I, I would, I've been impressed with computers and what they can do. What I really mean to say is, we already have ethics embedded in our systems that use AI. But that's a and separate instead question, of worrying though, about right? So, so you're a bit conflating, I think, here, because the ethics is important issue. It's pertinent to your work. But right now, we're not saying ethics is not there. We're just saying, is it going to be a rational, self-interested, or self-optimizing, intelligent agent that's equal in all effective, measurable things that matter to a human being. Yeah, I'm very skeptical that it will ever be self-interested unless we train it to to be to self-interested in. But, you know, like that's something that we have power over. I, I, I guess I I know what you mean by being conflating, but I actually think that that's what they're doing. The singularity people who are interested in singularity is that they are conflating what we have power over and what we don't have power over. We, the builders of these machines, we it's have the power to decide not to make them self-interested. We have the power to decide not to give them control. But th that's interesting because Gary is a skeptic, but he's an optimist at the same time because he thinks that we can't, and, and he's pointing out towards problems such as the learning, the fact that machines are not really learning and they're just conflating you know, correlation with causation because right now they're so-called learning is basically statistical methods, which is why Joshua Bach called it AI statistics on steroids. Yeah. Basically, it's a high level, high degree of approximation, uh, yep. and it's not really getting the causation, the causal It certainly mechanism. isn't. That's absolutely important. And I agree point. with that. But, but at the same time, Gary said that while the current attempts are kind of the wrong avenue, if you will, he said that in the long run, We'll figure it out. And he says that according to him, there's no evidence that suggests that we cannot have a machine do the same things that the human does because the best evidence is that the human brain, which is a physical uh, object, you know, exists and does all those things. And there's no evidence to suggest that you can't have the same functionality within like a microchip or some other stratum that's different than our biological brains. Look, I'll, I'll say it this way, like with Gary's approach, I, which I think is thoughtful, I think that it would be well within the realm of possibility that my child, when they're older, will have an AI in their house that says, you know, I looked at the, the weather and I, and, I, and I noticed in my rain and I think you should wear this because you always have 
better days when you don't get wet feet and uh, you you really like this outfit and it looks good on you. And considering that you've lost a couple pounds lately, I think this would be, in other words, it, it could give you good advice. It could contextualize information sure. and give you good advice. But I don't think we'll ever need to have algorithms that say, don't turn me off, please don't turn me off. I wanna live. Like that would be a choice that we would be making to tell the algorithm to protect itself. We don't have to make that choice. Yeah, so That's my like point. Basically an advanced version of sort of Siri, Alexa, and Wolfram Alpha or something like that yeah. mixed together. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. So let's let's go back to your book though. Uh, so where do we get here? So we, we discussed about how algorithms are opinions embedded in code. Now, and, and we talked about predictive uh policing, which is kind of minority report. We talked about the importance of opacity, uh, scale, and damage that WMGs do. Talk a little bit to me about fairness and efficiency and, and sort of the tension or interplay between these two. Because let's say, look, the, uh, the police force would say again, we need to be efficient and effective in deploying our scarce resources. And therefore, we use this to send the police cruisers to be where they're needed because we can't send cars everywhere, right? Right. Therefore, we have to be efficient and therefore we are being efficient by using this Predpol uh, software. What's wrong yeah. with that? Well, I mean, it's, it's wrong if and only if like they're actually not completing their mission, right? So I spent a lot of time um, talking about how algorithms replace difficult conversations that we're trying not to have. <laughs> we're trying to avoid the conversation. Um, what is it? What makes a teacher a good teacher? Because we, if we got six education experts in the room, they wouldn't be able to agree on that. So we, instead we're like, let's replace it with a silver bullet algorithm where we don't let people ask questions about how it works. I mean, that's kind of very, very high level what I think is happening. And I think, in terms of the police uh, algorithm, in similar way, we're not asking hard questions like what, what are police actually meant to do? And how do we know if we are getting where we even know about the crimes that we care the most about? I mean, the truth is we don't, the police don't actually know about all the crimes because some populations would, like I said in Houston, but it happens in every city and every, in every town, some crimes are not reported to the police because people don't trust the police. Um, and other, you know, so what about them? The, those, those algorithm that you could talk about efficiency, but efficiency is somehow a secondary concern. The primary concern should be, are we actually completing our mission? And that larger question isn't being addressed whatsoever by algorithms. Now I'm not saying that algorithms have to solve every single problem. But I'm just saying that if we only focus on efficiency, then we're, we could be like very proud of ourselves for doing something quite badly, but efficiently, instead of asking ourselves, are we actually accomplishing our mission? I think it could be very illuminating here if we talk a little bit about the examples that you give from education uh, in the United States. Uh, and I, to be honest with you, I, I haven't checked on to see if that's being used in Canada, but I imagine there may be some, because as far as policing goes, I know there are some jurisdictions who are already experimenting in Canada with Predpol type software, but I'm, I don't, I'm not aware of the educational system. But t give us a few examples, because over there people say the same thing. Look, we have inefficiencies, we have so many people uh, or students failing out of high school, per year and we know all of these happen here and here and we suspect it's the teacher's fault, uh, right? So we have this software and that software basically identifies weak or failing teachers who basically are not up to, to snuff and the system therefore would be more efficient and will be served better if we just fire them uh, and hire effective and efficient and better better teachers how is that bad or wrong or not working well i mean the logic that you just said is actually not that bad right like we who would argue against getting rid of terrible teachers like nobody would argue against that the problem is that the actual algorithm was a random number generator 
it was a random number generator. Like, and when I say that, I'm exaggerating very slightly. I saw um, the, the graph or the lack of graph that you're showing in your TED yeah. talk, which I'm going to attach to the article here, by the way, which is Good. basically freaking all over the place. So it was there's no, there's literally, no there's good evidence that it was a random number generator. And um, so now let me just, in that context, reframe what you said. In order to deal with, um, especially in inner city minority schools, urban school districts, in order to deal with like a high dropout rate, we are going to randomly persecute teachers and fire them if they get uh, a couple of bad scores in a row with, a, again, a random number generator. And that will solve that problem. Guess what? It didn't solve the problem. What ended up happening was teachers who um, had better options, like in other words, the best teachers, left. They went to the the suburban school districts that didn't have those regimes. Um, they got private schools. They retired early. Now we have a national teacher shortage. And the, ultimately, those schools have suffered because teacher churn, which is like getting rid of teachers, hiring new teachers who don't have that much experience, is actually terrible for a school and terrible for all the statistics, including the standardized tests. So it's just not a good model. Like, and are arguably, I'm not saying they made a, a minor mistake and they could tweak it and it would be a good model. We actually don't know how to decide whether a teacher is a good teacher. It's a frustrating fact, but the best we have probably is the principal evaluations. And yes, there are nepotism problems where principals protect their favorite friends, even if they're bad teachers. That's a problem. Um, but, but random number generators isn't solving that problem either. So it's, it's just one of those things where we just assumed it's called solutionism. I'm sure you've talked about it on your podcast. This idea that like whatever complicated, large systemic problem we have can be solved easily with a technological fix. It's just not true. We and it's particularly it not true. Reductionism before here on my podcast. What do you call it? Reductionalism. Okay. Whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's almost a philosoph philosophy um, and it's, it's a philosophy it that we have to challenge. It, it absolutely is. That's why the whole thesis of my podcast uh, and my work for the last 10 years has been the claim that technology is not enough. It's okay, necessary. Good. It's, it's necessary. It's not sufficient. Like we cannot live without technology, but it's not sufficient. And we can screw up things a lot worse if we have, because technology is just the how we do things. Yeah. It's not the why and it's not the what. And if you have, you can have the best how, but if you screw up your why or what, you're going to end up doing more damage than good. So the Gates Foundation was a huge pusher of this system that ended up being a random number generator. It's called the value added model. Wow. And here's an unbelievable but true story. Um, one of the things that seems pretty obvious in retrospect is to compare teacher scores from this value added model with the principal evaluations or the other kinds of assessments of teacher, you know, quality that are expensive. And the argument was always like, oh, it's too expensive to do that broadly. So we have to do this cheap data driven thing. Well, okay, fine. That makes sense. If you have provided scientific evidence, statistical evidence that what you're doing replicates any one of these sort of gold standard teacher assessments that are, that are arguably too expensive to use, but you have to at least show that there's, there's agreement, right? So they did a small, like maybe three schools. I don't remember exactly how many, but like a small sort of like side-by-side -side test of the teachers versus this value-added model, a value-added model versus the other kind of rubric. And guess what? They found very little correlation. I think it was 24% correlation. 24% is not a strong correlation when you're talking about people getting fired. And the Gates Foundation, when they saw this answer, their conclusion wasn't, we can never possibly use the value-added model because it's very poor at, at at confirming the, the other rubric. Instead, their conclusion was, oh, it must be picking up other information that the other, the fancy rubric doesn't see. There's it's, noise I mean, in the system. It, the, yeah, I actually, I, at this point, I, it doesn't even matter what, they, what their conclusion was. The, the, the real important thing is it didn't stop them. Like they saw evidence that this was not useful and they went ahead with it anyway because they were just like, we got to plow forward to improve education. And instead they have made education worse. 
That's very sad. I'm just watching Bill's Mind uh, on Netflix. I watched the first episode the other day. And of course, he's a complicated person, just like all of us are. But, you know, his his struggle to, you know, uh, sort of defeat malaria and all kinds of issues and produce like sanitary, you know, toilets for the third world and all those things like are commendable. But this there this example you just give us and many others like where he was totally out to lunch in my opinion um i'd love to have him on my show and discuss it with him but i don't know we'll see if that's going to happen i'll try i've tried in the past so anyway uh let's go back to to the topic here then so what's the what's the solution then if we have all those very well intentioned algorithms which as you call them are just opinions embedded in code and end up despite their best intentions you know the road to hell is paved with good intentions as they say they end up as wmds weapons of mass destructions as you call them what's the solution then is the solution then ethics because that's my solution that's been sort of what i've proposed i've proposed that you know ethics plays a crucial role in technology today whether we're aware or we're not because when you say you don't care about ethics that's an ethical choice and that is a sort of (laughs) sure is that ends up playing itself throughout the whole system yeah it's a very important point so what do we do well i like of course i i do care very deeply about ethics i think though that when you say ethics to a technologist they think oh like that's a soft subject which i'm not good at and i'm not interested in and it's not technical so i have taught myself to use the word accountability um Mm. because then at least they have the fear of litigation in them um so (laughs) my uh my thing is like throw science at it so what is it you know i just i just feel like we haven't become scientific about it um by the way that picture that you're going to put on your um, podcast from my TED talk, the, the random number generator of the value added model. I'm going I to have put asked, the whole talk basically. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah. Well, that particular slide though is for me like science. That is like a one picture audit of a system. It's yeah. like you, if you're going to give a, the same person for the same subject in the same year, two different scores, they better be consistent and they're not right. Yeah. Um, I've asked people who work at DOE's, that work on value added models more recently to show me that picture and they're not willing to do it. Right. And so I feel like, you know, ethics is obviously the goal, but if we can't even get science, then we're never going to get ethics. So let's get science. And so I call it accountability. Like what does it mean for an algorithm to be accountable? And so the big picture of accountability for me is for whom does this work and what does it mean to work? This, this being this algorithm, this algorithmic system, for whom does this fail and what does it mean to fail? And I think if you ask those questions in a sort of sort of broad enough sense and force the answers, then, and also you're like, well, how do you know the false positive rate is acceptable? What does it mean for it to be acceptable? What's the recourse? First of all, you have to, what's that? What's the recourse when it does fail? Right. Of course, that's, that's a, that's a question as well. But my, my point is that like people haven't even considered this question. Like they even haven't even asked themselves, what does it mean that my facial recognition software works for white men, but fails for black women? They have not like IBM, Microsoft, Amazon, they all put out this facial recognition software bragging about how great it was. They never even asked that question. Right. That's embarrassing for this, for the field. Right. Because they should have anticipated that this question of for whom does this fail would be asked and answered and it, they should have asked and answered it themselves locally. We so I, I guess my point is that like, go ahead. What we have, they have to falsify the algorithm. What do you mean? Just like any scientific theory, you have to find a condition to falsify it. And, and when it doesn't work, you know, all science needs to be falsifiable under such and right. such conditions. It yes. works. And therefore yes. under such and such conditions, yeah. it doesn't work. Exactly. You have to be able to poke holes in it at a scientific level. And I fully believe, and this might be my blind spot, that if we really did that to these algorithms, which by the way, would not require opening up the source code, they could keep their precious IP, which 
between you and me pretty much all looks the same. <laughs> um, they could keep all, like maybe the mistakes are slightly different in different codes. Um, they could keep their source code, but if we get to poke holes in it in a black box audit type of way, then the, the accountability that that would engender would lead to a very reasonable and open discussion about ethics. Yeah, you know, another thing that I just learned from you is that, you know, first of all, probably predominantly my audience is uh, engineers and IT professionals. So they're very technical and, 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 and probably a very large percentage of them have issues with the word ethics. Um, yeah. Uh, so, so that's a very good tip you just gave me in terms of the accountability sort of spin or angle, if you will, marketing of, of, of ethics. Sort Here's of. another marketing thing, which, which you just inspired me to, 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 to say. It's really a pitch to your audience, which is that it is a mistake, a very strong mistake, in my opinion, to think of this as a not a technical issue. Once we have poked holes in all, it falsified these algorithms and found the mistakes and realized we have ethical and legal constraints that we hadn't been considering before. It's not just about efficiency. It's not just about maximizing accuracy. It's much more complicated than that. The objective function is more complicated. The loss functions are more complicated. Optimizing to those crazy new kinds of objective functions is going to be a technical problem that is going to be the future it's going to be a field of computer science and it's going to be hard. And I challenge them to get good at that because that is going to be what, what uh, industry is going to be looking for is computer scientists who can optimize to these crazy new objective functions that take into account ethical and legal constraints. And that's the, I've had that conversations with, with professionals at very high level uh, on that topic and their usual responses you can't codify ethics. You can't do that. You can't do this. It's too complicated. It's too vague. And my answer to that is, well, welcome to the real world, guys. It's not Dude, zero and one. We are already doing white. it. Yeah, as you point out, the default assumption that we're not, we're not embedding ethics is itself an ethical choice. So we're just doing it in the stupidest, lamest possible way. Um, and we're going to have to do it in a better way. I mean, those are the conversations that I'm trying to start which is like what makes an algorithm legal. And I want, you know, it's, you're, they're right in the following sense. It's not going to be a fixed target. Um, it's going to move. As our values move, that's going to change. Absolutely. But it's to, to the, the idea that we would just don't have that constraint and we just maximize to efficiency and accuracy is, is wildly unethical, actually, in its, in its own right. Yeah, I remember there's a quote by, I think uh, it was Marvin Minsky when uh, one time one of his graduate students was questioning why he put certain kind of uh, uh, presuppositions uh, in the system. And then Marvin Minsky's answer was kind of like, so that we know what they are. Because if you take them out, you're not taking them out. You just don't know where they are. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, okay. But let's let's go down to what that actually means in the real world. Because uh, in your book, you're actually suggesting that uh, data scientists, among others, should have sort of like a Hippocratic oath, if you will, of, of ethics. And by the way, just before I had this interview with you, I got an email from somebody from the Danish Engineering Association where I spoke uh, a couple of months ago. And they're telling me that the Danish Associ uh, Engineering Association is developing such Hippocratic oath that all of their members, and if you're, I think, I think if it's the case that if you're an engineer in Denmark, basically you have to be a member of that organization. Yeah. So you have to, to, Take that That's off, right. just like old doctors do now. Yeah, yeah. You know, and I've been thinking about this a lot since the book came out, which is now almost three years ago, um, or almost exactly three years ago. Um, and a lot of people have been like, oh, Kathy, we have a Hippocratic Oath. You want to sign sign on it, you know, onto it? And I'm, no, like, it's a terrible Hippocratic Oath. <laughs> Typically, they are not very good, um, which isn't to say I've come up with a better one. I'm just saying like Hippocratic oaths have to have some meat on it. They, in particular, they have to say, if you are not allowing me as a data scientist to test, to see whether this is 
ethical or legal, then that's an ethical violation. And I think, and the reason I say it that way is because I think one of the most important thing to realize is that data scientists are typically just nice nerds who want to be good people and don't want to do evil things, but they work within larger companies that have shareholder value concerns and end up doing stuff that is probably really not great. But it's not like the data scientist has really the power to single-handedly change the business model. So I guess the first thing is the Hippocratic Oath has to have some teeth. It has to really have teeth in terms of like, I should be given, I should, part of my job is to make sure what I'm doing is, is legal. I mean, that's, doesn't sound that strong, but like the truth is we are doing things that could well be illegal, but we're not allowed to check it. You know, we're not even allowed to ask that question. And the flip side of that is just like you said, doctors have an ethical uh, Hippocratic oath. Some engineering societies do. I want data scientists to have not just this oath, but I want them to have the professional society behind that oath so that when they are being asked to do things that they consider unethical, that are violating their oath, they can, instead of just getting fired for refusing to do it, they can appeal to this professional society and say, hey, people in my company are being asked to do this and I'd like you to issue a press release with, you know, put pressure on this company and other companies in this industry to stop doing that. Like there needs to be like a whistleblower system and we don't have that. What we have now is, is a bunch of like professionals who feel like obligated to do whatever their boss tells them to do. They don't have power. Yeah. That's a, that's a very important point indeed. Yeah. Um, so, and, and I'm totally in support of it, of course. Now, now, we talked about Facebook, uh, and I, I think you qualify, of course, or I, I imagine Instagram as a WMD. I, I don't know enough about Instagram to know how it uses algorithms, to be honest. Isn't Instagram mostly like person-to-person, -person, like Twitter? No, no, it's kind of like, Twitter, but it's not Twitter is not person to person. It sends out a stream of images in the public and then they're kind of there. Right. And by the way, it's it's been shown that Instagram, if you're not familiar with it, is one of the most addictive ones. And also the people, it's a big predictor. Speaking of statistics, the people who are the most highly depressed and suffer from other addictive behavior are mm. the most uh, frequenting of Instagram. Uh, and as a result of all the social media platforms, Instagram has the highest suicide rates uh, God. And, and depression, but, but especially suicide rates. And, and I would really like this to be shut down, but I'll, I'll just say that, you know, since I don't know enough about it, I just want to back up and just make, make the point that like Twitter can be toxic as well, but it's not really algorithmic, right? I see the tweets. I mean, I know they've been adding algorithms more recently, but I go back a couple of years Twitter is just like you see the tweets that you of the people you follow on Twitter. It's still um, the case. It's still it can, the case. Right. My, well, now they sort of switch up the order that you see them. So there is an algorithm. There is an editing process by the algorithm. Mm -hmm. But I just want to make the point that even before that, like Twitter was toxic in its own way. And like it wasn't an algorithmic toxin, right? It, mm -hmm. It's just a design thing. So I'm a little bit hesitant to call something a WMD if I think that the negative aspects of it are actually coming through design rather than algorithm. Now there could be a generalized concept of a weapon of some, you know, it wouldn't be math though. It's a design, like weapon of design destruction. Do you see what I'm saying? Well, Sean Parker said that they were very cognizant of the fact that their whole purpose was to hack the human biology. The weakness it's evil. Is Don't get me wrong. It's totally evil. And it's taking advantage of insecurities and making people more insecure. And I would even, I would go further. I'm writing a book about shame now in large part because people have, since I've wrote, written the weapons of mass destruction, people have come up to me and said, what about this? Is this a WMD? And I'm like, no, that's just people being awful. <laughs> you know, it's just it, like people are awful. And why are they awful? And why, what do they get out of being awful? And that has led me into this entirely new field, which I'm writing about now, which is like the social mechanism of shame. And I think I need to learn about Instagram for that book. Um, I'm just making the stupid, uh, obvious point that like sometimes things are horrible and destructive, but they're not 
algorithms. They're just horrible and destructive for other reasons. And that is a combination of how they play on our biases and how they're designed to play on our biases and to make us feel bad about ourselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I get that, but but I think it fits your definition of widespread, secret, and destructive. So Okay, so tell me why. Tell me why. Tell me more about the algorithm. Well, Instagram is widespread, clearly. Yep, that's for sure. It has impact. It's secret because uh, the way it sort of hacks your brain and it creates addiction yeah. by design, by design. Ad admittedly by the creators of it, yep. it's actually doing exactly what it was supposed to be doing. Yeah. Right, uh, and also tends to target or it, at least play itself out as I, as I said with the most vulnerable people in the sense mm. that people who suffer depression, people yeah. who uh, are self-conscious or have some kind of complex of how they look or anything else yeah. tend, tend, tend to congregate uh. the most on Instagram. The result of this is that they're actually the most likely to actually attempt at least if not commit fully suicide so we know let me give you two examples straight from my life okay we had a friend of ours um nelson and he's like mid 30s maybe early 30s professional guy uh i just met him once or twice so not really good friend but we got together on a wedding that we were sitting together anyway great guy he started listening to my podcast you know, made a contribution, loved my podcast and stuff like that. And then one day, I used to see him on Instagram and on Twitter. And one day, he killed himself. And I was just, I was just like shocked, like total, total shocked. And I was like, and basically, I felt super guilty because we were supposed to go out for dinner once. And uh, so I had a, sort of like an emergency, so I had to postpone it. And then we never actually got to it to to. Yeah. book another date and yeah. time because I was traveling afterwards and, and then I was like, oh my God, if I knew he's depressed, but I never knew he's depressed in the first right. place, right? And, then, and you think that's also because of Instagram, the way it works that you didn't know? I don't know, but then listen to this. Uh, my One of my wife's cousins was like literally obsessive Instagram user. And I, when I say obsessive, I mean, imagine this. Uh, Instagram allows you to post a video of you like up to one minute. So imagine her waking up first thing in the morning and she's sitting on the toilet and she's doing a Instagram video. That's what I God. mean, obsessive, right? God. That's what I mean. And I was telling my wife, you know what? I was reading a statistics that Instagrammers are the most likely, the highest likelihood of committing suicide. And I wonder if Roxy is not kind of like a risk factor for that. Because she's yeah. like early 40s, she's professional, she's single, she doesn't seem to have direction. I'm just concerned. She's not very yeah. c confident of her like professional or personal looks and all that stuff. And then the week after, she posts on, on Instagram something like, I've had it, I've had it, it's over for me, right? And then my wife freaks out. We start uh, trying to call her and where is she? In the ER. She, she took a bunch of sleeping pills and now they're like, trying to, you know, empty her stomach and all that stuff. So she actually made it. But oh my God. But like two people in our close circles. And that is are, horrible. And those are all sort of 30 to 43 year range or 33 to 43 years. It is brutal. It's Perfect. a brutal situation. And very strong Instagram users. So and, and so that kind of from our own life confirms yeah. the statistics and the studies that I had read before. And yeah. by the way, the, the algorithm that was developed for that is the algorithm of, of what used to be called uh, the one-armed bandits, uh, basically the slot machines in Las Vegas. Right. That's the math behind it, which are designed to give you the exact amount of reward. Oh, shit. Yes. Right? Now I know what you're talking about. So that they keep you hooked. So it's, as, like, a, it's like a conditioned response. Right. And you should go... 100% and there's a there's the the persuasive technology lab in Stanford by the way and I think the the guy's name is BJ Murphy or I'm not sure about his family name but he, he, it's BJ something and they actually develop and work on that tech and, and the, the so for example his students develop the like button on, on Facebook develop Instagram and all of that so it's yeah, all those brutal. math algorithms combined with certain behaviorist models, which are designed to neurologically and biochemically hack your sort of uh, uh, hormonal system that gives you these rewards, dopamine hits and stuff yeah. like that, 
yeah. so that it keeps you it keeps you hooked just enough to keep coming but never to be satiated <laughs> Yeah. And that's the whole point of, of the one arm. Yeah. You know, I, I know, I know what you're talking about now. Yeah. Yeah. That's you, you, you've convinced me. You've convinced me. It's, and very sadly, um, and I've interviewed people about shame for my book and trust me when I tell you that Instagram, it plays very often and very highly in that whole story. And so, yeah, I mean, I don't, I don't know why we let this happen, but it's yeah. awful. So I, I personally actually canceled and deleted my account after all these things happened. Yeah, I never had one. Uh, <laughs> and I will not. Yeah, I, I did have one. I did have one. And people are like, you're crazy. You know, you're trying to get keynote speaking bookings. And, you know, how are people going to find you if you, you had like a thousand people or something? I was like, you know what? People almost, one person died and one almost died around me. Yeah, that's Thank not you. okay. That's not, not okay. I'm not having it. Good for you. Time. Yeah. So, Resist. Anyway, so, okay, so we're coming towards the end of our conversation here. So let me just give a quote that I love of you from, from your book, and then I'll ask you the last two questions. So my second favorite quote from your book is kind of coming nine minutes within the the conclusion, I think, that you have in the book, because, you know, I didn't read the book. I listened to the audio. Yeah. Version. And it goes like this, quote, big data possesses, uh, big data processes codify the past. They do not invent the future. Doing that requires moral imagination. And that's something only humans can provide. End of quote. And to me, that's like another way of saying I have this metaphor that I like to use, which is called that, you know, in Silicon Valley, people like to say that technology is a crystal ball that allows us to see the future. And I say it's absolutely not a crystal ball. It's actually a magnifying mirror. Yes. It's a mirror because it's not about the future. It's about who we are and what we do, but it magnifies and amplifies and exaggerates those effects. So Agreed. it always has unforeseen consequences. Um, so it's not out there. It's in here that we have to yeah. look. If anything, um, it's just a reflection, not just of us currently, but of us past, you know, and to the extent that we use algorithms to predict the future, we are propagating the past with all the mistakes we've made in the past plus the ones that we're inventing now. Yeah. Well, Kathy, we've been talking with you for over 95 minutes uh, so far, and I appreciate that very much. So let me ask you the last two questions that I always ask in sure. the end. First sure. of all is, where can people find more about you and your work? Um, well, in addition to the TED Talk and the book, um, I've, I've written a lot for Bloomberg Opinion. Um, so I have quite a few columns going back the last three years for, for Bloomberg. I wrote my blog, mathbabe.org, for years and years. I haven't been keeping up with it recently. But if you want to look at really old sex advice I used to give to math geeks, then um, <laughs> I had a column called On Pythia, which I really, really had fun with. I kept on asking people to ask me for sex advice. They kept on asking me for job advice. So it's really not enough sex, too much math, but there, there you have it. <laughs> Um, and as I mentioned, I'm coming out with a book about shame. Um, maybe it's probably called the shame machine and it'll probably come out in 2021, early 2021. That's all fantastic. And I have this terrible joke, so I don't know if it's a stupid thing to say, but you know, the difference between a nerd and a geek. What's that? So a geek wonders what sex in zero gravity is. A nerd wonders what sex is. <laughs> Brutal. Yeah, but, but know, kind of true, true. <laughs> kind of true. <laughs> anyway, so that was kind of a digression, hopefully a funny digression, but a digression. The most important thing, though, is like we've been talking to you to, for an hour and 40 minutes approaching now. What is the most important thing that you would like our viewers and listeners to take away from this conversation with you today? Well, considering your audience of technologists, I think the most important thing is that we are privileged to have as much power as we do and we should use it wisely um, and we should never intimidate people um, in order to like hide the value judgments that we're actually um, we're embedding in our work so we should always try to be as undefensive and as willing to discuss you know as, as open to discussion as possible, the, the questions that people have, the reasonable questions they have about how technology is informing and curating their lives. 
because I mean, we don't need to be experts in technology to know that what's happening is affecting us all. Kathy O'Neill, thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It was fun. If you guys enjoy this show, you can help me make it better in a couple of ways. You can go and write a review on iTunes or you can simply make a donation. 